would go ahead and open your Bibles up to John. I, I don't even, anybody count how many we baptized? Nine? Okay. Amen. I, mean, I was sharing with uh, some others earlier that uh, I, I feel like I know why the Lord had us do that because of that message. If we all know what the enemy does, you'll hear a word from the Lord. And God will challenge you to make a decision. And then you have every intention of maybe following through next week or the week after. But a lot happens between Sunday and Sunday. And we have a way of talking ourselves out of a lot of stuff that we ought to be doing. And the Lord requires immediate obedience. So by the Lord moving the way he did this morning, I believe it set a lot of people free this week from a lot of doubt and worry and putting things off and putting things off and putting things off. And now they're going to be able to move forward in their, their, their Christian walk with the Lord. Amen? Because that's been settled. It's been settled. Move on now. It's been settled. No, no longer do you have to be in limbo anymore. It's been settled. So, all right. But y'all have already heard that sermon, haven't you? Okay. And by the way, uh, often we, uh, we may counsel with uh, people about, well, this is what baptism means. This is what salvation means. They heard the clearest presentation of salvation and baptism in that sermon. So when they came forward, they knew what they were coming forward for, right? And so uh, let's uh, look there at John chapter 12. And uh, what one, I love this passage of Scripture. This is when Mary anoints, not his mother, of course, but when Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anoints the feet of Jesus. And so I want us to look at that. And uh, that is my intention, even before the baptism a thon, uh, was just to look at this passage of Scripture today, okay? Because there's so much here. And so we're just going to spend our time looking at this, the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on from there and look at the triumphal entry next week. So you'll need to be ready to, to discuss uh, chapter 12, verses, verse 12 and following the rest of the chapter next week. Okay? All right. So let's look. Let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 11. So the Bible says, six days before the Passover... Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving. Now notice who's all involved in this account, okay? So we have Martha serving. Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of fragrant oil, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this fragrant oil sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, Leave her alone. She has, kept, she, has, she has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Then a large crowd of the Jews learned where he was. And they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. Therefore the chief priests decided to also kill Lazarus. Why? Well, verse 11. Because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. So because of Lazarus' witness, right? Because of his witness, they wanted to kill him. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this, and we're going to make some very practical points. But then I want to look at some deep theological truth that is found here um, that, we, that you may not see on just a surface-level reading, all right? 
First of all, the Bible says that this is six days before the, the Passover, so we're, we're about to have the triumphal entry, and so we're drawing close to the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is in Bethany at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead back in John chapter 11. And uh, so they were having dinner for him. Martha was there serving. Lazarus was reclining at the table. So you picture this in your mind. And then Mary. The Bible says that Mary, just she took a pound of fragrant oil, pure and expensive nard, and she anointed the feet of Jesus. We know that this anointing oil was very expensive because the passage tells us that it was expensive. We also know that it was expensive because Judas Iscariot, here in just a few moments, says, why wasn't this sold for 300 denarii, which was equivalent to almost a year's wage, right? But let me tell you about this oil that she, that she used. The Bible says that it was expensive. It was a pure nard, and it comes from a plant in India. Yeah, in India. And so not only was it uh, so not only was it expensive, but it came from a it came it came from a very uh, distant place to be that, there where where it was. And so there was a lot of there was a lot of trouble that went through to get it, and that was the reason it was just so expensive is because of where it came from. And so she took this very expensive bottle of oil. And we know not only from this passages, but from other passages, that she broke the she broke it. There was nothing left. She broke it, and she anointed the feet of Jesus with it. Um, the Bible says here in John's account that Mary took the pound of fragrant oil, pour and, uh, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the oil was. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And the reason it was filled is because, literally, she broke it. As a matter of fact, hold your place there in John chapter 12 and turn over to Mark 14. Okay, look at Mark chapter 14, verse 3. Okay, so let's read this. It says, and this is Mark's account of the same story. It says, while he was in Bethany at the house of Simon, who had a serious skin disease, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster. We know who the woman is, right? Because, of, okay. The woman came with an alabaster jar of pure and expensive fragrant oil of nard. She broke the jar. Do you see that? So John says she wiped his feet with it, but literally the picture here is, is she broke the jar. And now that's very important. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But she broke the jar of expensive fragrance. She broke it and she poured it on his head. Well, some would say, well, do we have a contradiction here? Because John says she anointed his feet. Mark says he anointed, she anointed his head. It's not a contradiction. You just need both accounts to get the, per, the, the whole picture. So according to the, both accounts, it wasn't just the feet or the head. It was both. She anointed the head and the feet of Jesus. It's not a contradiction. One writer is just emphasizing certain points of the account, uh, different portions of the account that the other author is not. But verse 4, it says, but some were expressing indignation to one another. That would be Judas. Why has this fragrant oil been wasted? Notice that they, that's what they say. It's been wasted. For this oil might have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. And when they begin to scold her, Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for me. Notice that what she did, did was affirmed by Jesus. Jesus not only affirmed it, but he said it was a noble thing. Okay? He says in verse 7, You always have the poor with you, and you do good for them whenever you want. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. I assure you, Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to hand him over. And when they heard this, they were glad and promised to give him silver. 
So they started looking for an opportunity to betray him. So now we get the whole picture. If you'll turn back over into John chapter 12. So she takes this very costly vial of perfume. She breaks it and anoints the head and the feet of Jesus with it. And then Jesus affirms what she did. He actually refers to it as a noble thing. And then he goes on to say that what she has done will be spoken of. It would go down as a testimony. It would be her legacy. And what I want to talk to us about, and I don't want to, you know, um, here we are in our stewardship emphasis. And, and is it by happenstance that here we are in John chapter 12? I don't think so. So what we have here in John chapter 12 is a true picture of, of giving, don't we? She takes something that's very precious to her, very valuable, and what does she do with it? She breaks it, and she gives it to Jesus. Her giving was noble, and the reason her giving was noble is because it was characterized by sacrifice. Remember what we talked about last week? That our giving should be to the point of sacrifice. Now, why would I say that? Why would I say that our giving should be to the point of sacrifice? That, that's not a rhetorical question. I want you to answer that for me. Why would I say that our giving should be to the point of sacrifice? Because it should cost us something. Now, why is it? Why should it cost us something? Exactly. Because the biblical example that we have, the ultimate example that we have of giving is found in Jesus Christ. And Jesus' gift to us, God's gift of His Son, was sacrificial. God's gift of His Son cost Him something. It cost God His own Son, but it also cost Christ His life. And so therefore, do we, should we assume that our giving should be any different. Our giving should be sacrificial. Our giving should cost us something. That is something that the widow understood. You remember the widow, the story of the widow's mite? She understood that. And not only did Jesus affirm Mary here, but he also affirmed the widow when she gave her mite, right? Why? Because she gave out of her poverty. Her giving was sacrificial. It cost her something. And once again, we have the same picture here, the same example of Mary. Her giving was sacrificial. Her giving cost her something, and the Lord affirmed her. Now, um, I, I never have been able to figure out why. Now, I can understand why a lost person would. And I'm not saying this to be negative or to be judgmental. I'm just being transparent. Can I be transparent with you? All right, let me be transparent. I'm just sharing with you a struggle that I have. All right? So I'm being transparent. Anytime you speak on giving or teach on giving, from a pastor's, from my side of the fence, okay? Now, you hear things I don't hear. So... I, I'm sure that you guys hear some yay yang, okay, about, oh, church just wants money. Here we are talking about money again, blah, blah, blah. But from my side of the fence, we hear things too, okay? Well, the church, here's some of the things that we hear. The church just don't understand. The church just don't understand that I'm in a position right now where I can't give, and they should understand that. They should be sensitive to that. Those are the type of things that we hear, okay? Now, here's my, here's my, here's, here's my problem. Is that, first of all, is when they say that we don't understand. Most of you heard my testimony last week. To tell me that I don't understand, or to say that we don't understand, when I spent two years tithing off of a $15,000 a year income, and 
And I promise you, some of those people saying that make a lot more than $15,000 a year. It's not an issue of being able to give. It's an issue of the heart. It's a heart issue. It's not an ability issue. Now, we didn't have cable television. We didn't have all the, the fancy doodads. But our needs were met every single day in Christ. And we never went without. And we always gave. And I never felt like it was a burden to give. I have always felt like it is a privilege to give. Now, you should want to be a part of a church that teaches on giving. I'm going to tell you why. Because according to the scripture, when you give sacrificially to the Lord, there is, He promises great blessing in return. And as your pastor, I want you to experience the abundant life by being obedient to the Lord in every aspect of your life. Okay? And so, Jesus taught us in the Word. He says, and when you give. On the Sermon on the Mount. And when you give. And when you give. And when you give. In the Sermon on the Mount, I'd encourage you to go study it. Jesus spent a whole sermon there just talking about giving. And he gave us instruction. He gave us instructions on giving. When you give, don't sound your trumpet as the as the Pharisees do, and they just do it to be seen. And so there there are, there are ways that we're to give. We're to we're not to let our right hand know what our left hand's doing, and those type of things. We're not to boast about what we give. We're to give, and and we give to the Lord. We don't give to be seen. We don't. And so there there are guidelines. There. There, there are certain things that we are to obey, but make no mistake about it, Jesus says, and when you give, it is an ex expectation. It is a privilege that the Lord allows us to participate in. It's also an act of obedience. And so our giving should be sacrificial because that is the biblical model that we have in Christ. Okay? Now, uh, now I want to share with you some theological truth that we gain from this passage of Scripture. I'm not going to spend time, very long on this one because I've already mentioned it. But you'll remember that I said to you that ultimately that Lazarus' resurrection is a picture of our salvation. And so when we see Lazarus reclining at the table with Jesus, that is a picture of not only our future, but it is a picture of how the Lord sees us now. Ephesians chapter 2 says that He made us alive together with Christ. He raised us up with Him and He seated us, past tense, He seated us with Christ in the heavenlies. And so we, hear, so we have a picture here of Lazarus reclining with the Lord at the table. It is a picture of, of the believer seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So there's a now but not yet aspect to it, which is common in, in, in Scripture. Some things, they're now, we experience them now, but ultimately we don't experience them in their fulfillment until the future. So now the Lord sees us. Now the Lord sees us seated with Christ. But ultimately this is a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb which I personally believe takes place during the tribulation period because I am a premillennial, pre-tribulation guy, okay, just so you know that. If you're, I believe that the rapture will occur before the tribulation period. And if, if you want to know more about that, I start the book of Revelation next, uh, next Wednesday night. And so um, you'll be able to hear why I believe that. Okay, And I believe that the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place between the bride and his bridegroom, the church, in heaven during the tribulation period. And so I believe that we have a picture here of that. 
But not only do we have a picture here of that, but I also believe that we have an example of how we should live. And I want to use Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I believe that the life, I believe if you, if you take Mary, Martha, and Lazarus and you put them all together, that you have a threefold picture of what our life should look like. What is, what is Mary doing? Mary is worshiping, isn't she? Mary is worshiping the Lord. And what does true worship look like? True worship, and, and I'm not just talking about giving now, I'm talking about your, your life in general. True worship is about giving the Lord your best. It's about sacrifice. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12? I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice. And so Mary is worshiping. Our lives should be a life of worship. What do we see Martha doing? Serving. Mary's worshiping. Martha is serving. Are we not called and commanded to serve in the Scripture? To model and follow the example of Jesus? So we see Mary worshiping, we see Martha serving. And what do we see Lazarus doing? Some would say reclining. Well, yes, he's reclining. But according to uh, verse 11, he's witnessing. Because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. So because of the witnessing, because of the witness of Lazarus, right? Because of the witness of Lazarus, they wanted not only to kill Jesus, they wanted to kill Lazarus. So Mary worshiping, Martha serving, Lazarus witnessing. And I truly believe that we, if, if we have a threefold example there of what our life should look like holistically. Our life should be a one of worship. Our life should be one of serving. Our life should be one of our life should be one of witnessing. And what is our motivation for this? And again, if we come back to this, this account here, what is our motivation for the witness, the worship, and the serving? What is our motivation? Well, it's the fact that we've been raised from the dead. Right? As Lazarus was raised from the dead physically, we have been raised from the dead spiritually. Why is, why is Martha worshiping or serving? Because her brother has been raised from the dead. Why is Mary worshiping? Her brother has been raised from the dead. Why is Lazarus witnessing? Because he has been raised from the dead. So what is our motivation for witnessing, worshiping, and serving? Is the fact that we have been raised from the dead and the people that we love and care about who are saved have been raised from the dead. Right? So... Um, so a lot of theological truth here in this passage of Scripture. So uh, she breaks the, the oil. She anoints the head and the feet of Jesus. Uh, uh, verse 6, it says, now again, why did she do this? Well, Jesus tells us that she did this in preparation for his, his burial. Okay? Did she know? I mean, people get into all this. Did she know really what she was doing? Did she really know that she was preparing his body for burial? And how much did she really know? I don't know <laughs> how much she really knew. The Lord doesn't seem to suggest that she was ignorant of what she was doing. He, what he does is he explains why she's doing it, doesn't he? That she's anointing his body for burial. So did Mary get it? Did Mary get it when others missed it? Perhaps. Or maybe she didn't have it all figured out, but she was just trying to be obedient. Isn't that a good witness? Because there's certain things we're not going to have, we're not going to have it all figured out. There's going to be things that we don't understand. But just be obedient to what you know. Be obedient to the revelation that you have. Right? So, and that's exactly what Mary's doing. She's being obedient to the revelation that she has. Jesus tells us that she is anointing his body for burial. Once again, prophecy concerning his crucifixion. Um, verse 6, 
He didn't say this because, talking about Lazarus, he wanted, I mean, Judas wanted to know, hey, we should sell this and give it to the poor. Well, he really wasn't concerned about the poor. He just wanted it for himself, right? And he goes on to prove that with his actions later on in betraying Jesus. Jesus stands up for the woman. He says, leave her alone. Verse 7, she has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you. You can always do good to them, Jesus says. You can always do good to the poor, and we should. He says, but you don't always have me. And then as a result of this, verse 9, then a large crowd of the Jews learned he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one who he had raised from the dead. Therefore the chief priest decided to also kill Lazarus because of his witness, um, because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. Okay? So comments or questions? That's right. Lazarus is going, yeah, Lazarus will get raised again, won't he? Lazarus, man, think about Lazarus. Man, he had three resurrections. I'm kind of, we get two, don't we? Two resurrections. Spiritual re resurrection when we were saved, and one day we were going to get a bodily resurrection. Lazarus got spiritual resurrection because when he was saved, he got, he died, then he got a physical resurrection, and then he's all, one day in the soon and very soon, he's going to get his ultimate resurrection, right? Yeah. Any other comments or questions? None? All right. Well, then next week, be prepared. to. We'll, we'll start on the triumphal entry of Jesus, and uh, we'll, we'll start right there and move forward, okay? Yes. Sure. What's their last names? Walker? Okay. She'll handle all that. Okay. Well, let's pray for the Walker family, okay? Heavenly Father, we do pray for this family, and it seems as though they've been hit by a lot of trial from various different sides and death and sickness, and despair. And God... One thing that we know for sure is that you are sovereign and you are ruling and reigning on your throne and we can stand upon your promises. And Lord, I ultimately pray that this family knows the Lord. I pray that their trust is in you and I pray that they would be drawn close to you. I pray for Joe Walker, God, and I pray for his healing, that you'd heal his body, God of this sickness, that you'd preserve his life and protect him. And God, that you would comfort his mother and grant her the peace that surpasses all understanding. Minister to this family, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.